Tanakoto Katoa, good evening everyone, and welcome to our fourth conversation in this series looking at creation care in a climate change century. I am Nicola Hoggard Cregan, co director of NZCIS, and with me is um, Dr. Sarah Wilson, in charge of programs at ISCAS, and at least one of Reverend Dr. Chris Mulheron, executive director of ISCAS. Welcome back from all of us. Thank you so much for supporting this series. We really appreciate it. And we are thrilled tonight to have an exposition of Maori theology of nature. Someone said to me the other day that um, indigeneity is absolutely necessary in considering a theology um, and our place in nature. And Dr. Jay Matenga is a part of a new wave of indigenous Christian theologians in Aotearoa who are discovering their whakapakupa or their genealogy, and at the same time rethinking the Christian stance of nature. Jay is a Maori theologian of missions practice who serves as the director of the World Evangelical Alliance Global Witness Department and executive director of its mission commission. Jay is also the leader of Missions Interlinked New Zealand, the association of missions and outreach organizations in New Zealand. Jay has studied missions in a wide variety of institutions and countries, obtaining a BMIN in, um, from, um, from the Worldview Center for Intercultural Studies in Tassie, a diploma of missiology from the Australian College of Theology, an MA from all nations in the UK, and a doctorate in intercultural studies um, from Fuller Theological Seminary. Jay is developing a biblically authentic theology for a new era of missions that is less beholden to a Euro-American theological consensus. Drawing on his indigenous background, Jay believes that mutuality is the way forward for our participation in God's mission, which extends from individuals to positively impact their families and neighborhoods, their societies, and importantly, their habitats. So as usual, Jay will speak for about 30 minutes, um, followed by 30 minutes of discussion. I will moderate that and please feel free to put your questions in the chat box at any time during the talk. So I will now pass uh, over to Sylvia, who will say a prayer for us before we begin. Thank you, Sylvia. Tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou, uh, nga mihi nui uh, kia koutou, uh, ka mihi nui uh, kia koe, Jay. Uh, he uh, for us this evening. Um, this prayer uh, was written by the Auckland Diocesan um, Sustainability field worker Kathy B. Riley. Plus a little extra tereo chucked in by myself. E te atua o te aroha, our loving creator. Ngā maunga, ngā moana, mountains and oceans, mighty kauri and playful tui. Now, ngā mea katoa, all creation belongs to you. Remind us of our role as caretakers and gardeners, kaitiaki, kaimara. O mai tō wairua tapu, send your spirit to renew our hurting world. O mai tō kaha, give us the courage and strength to simplify our life, to share what we have, to bear the cost of change and to sow the seeds of hope for future generations. Through Jesus Christ, who is reconciling all things through the cross. Amen. Well, I certainly hope that what I have to share with you this evening scratches some itch, or at least creates an itch, perhaps, that we can then scratch afterwards in the Q&A. Um, there's just so, so much that I could have said. I'm going to start with some... Uh, digging out some assumptions uh, tonight and hopefully we can take it from there. So uh, without further ado, in the spirit of uh, um, or close relations, I first want to honour and acknowledge the uh, traditional custodians of country throughout Australia and acknowledge their connections to land, sea and community, which Tangata Whenua or Aotearoa uh, myself and, and Māori can uh, also share. So my sincere respects to Ngā Kaumatua, the elders past and present, and I recognise the mana of all Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples today. Ngā mihi nui ki a koutou katoa, ngā iwi o te pāpaka a Māori. 
that is. Warm greetings to all of you who live in the land of Maui's great crab. <laughs> Kia tau te araha, noa ki koutou me te ranga marie, he mia nga te atua, nga to mātou mātua, nga te ariki hoki, nga ihu kraiti. So grace and peace to you all in God, our Father, and the Lord Jesus Christ. In nga ranga tera, i hui hui nei, nga mihi nui ki a koutou katoa, respected leaders, here gathered, uh, I greet you all very warmly, whether from Aotearoa or Australia. Tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou katoa. Three times, greetings to you all in the Māori tongue of my forefathers. Ko Takitimu uh, Te Waka, my tribal canoe is the Takitimu. Uh, ko Te Waka o Kope me Tuhirangi, nga maunga. So my mountains are known as the canoes of, tu, of Kupe and Tuhirangi, the Tanifa or the sea serpent that Kupe chased across the Pacific in his discovery of Aotearoa. Uh, ko Rumahanga Te Awa, my river is the Rumahanga, which flows down from the Wairarapa Valley in the north in the Tararua Ranges. And it was this river, in this river, that I was baptized as a new believer in Christ in 1984. Ko Ngāti Kahanganu, uh, Ki Wararapa, Ko Ngāti Pro, Ko Kaitahu o Ko Iwi. So I have birth heritage connections to uh, these tribes, which span the east coast of the North Island and some of the south. Uh, but Ko Ngāti Rakai Whakairi Toko Hapu. So my family group uh, is the Ngāti Rakai Whakairi, uh, which means to hang up in adornment, uh, beautiful people. So my, my people's belonging place, our meeting place is called Kohunui. Ko Jay Matenga toko ingoa. So my, my name is Jay Matenga. Raranga katoa. And it's all ro woven uh, together. Norera, therefore, tena koto, tena koto, tena koto katoa. Te moriora. This is the vital life force. There's a literal translation of that. So by way of introduction, um, today we're reminded of the vital life force from the book of Colossians, chapter 1. You're very familiar with that, verses 15 and 17 in particular, which reads here on the screen, Christ is the visible image of the invisible God. He existed before anything was created and is supreme over all creation. He existed before anything else and he holds all creation together. But I present here before you as one who is indigenous to Aotearoa, New Zealand. I'm a Māori by my father's line, whose father, my paternal grandfather, had only Māori heritage. As a Māori, I identify as an evangelical Christian insofar as I hold strongly to a biblical, allegiant, and activistic faith. Allegiant in the, in the sense that I follow the crucified and resurrected Christ as Lord and experience God by the enabling of the Holy Spirit given to those who follow Christ. Activism is simply the living out of my faith in this world of broken relationships that we inhabit. So in this presentation, I will fly over some touch points related to my topic, the intimacy of indigenous epistemologies, with a specific reference to connecting with creation. Um, a little bit more obliquely as it turned out. But my underlying thesis is that the myth of separation is a root cause of major dysfunction in our worlds, uh, plural intended. It's not so much that we are separated in terms of distance, but that we are buffered from reality because of the illusion of autonomy arising in no small part from Cartesian dualism, which remains a first principle for the industrial world a world uh, that begs some de definition. So let me introduce you to the schema I use to explore two quite different realities, the industrial on the one hand and the indigenous on the other. So the, the term indigenous, as you likely know, literally means of the land. So it implies connection to a specific location. In many contexts, the term has attracted a negative sense that diminished the dignity of the people who were considered to be indigenous. In recent times, however, it's regained status and there is a pride in being considered indigenous now. 
my use of the word builds on the UN definition of indigeneity and it adds to it the integrated values of people throughout the world who have a collectivist orientation. A contrast in indigenous ecolo e ecology of knowing and indigenous episteme, to borrow Michel Foucault's term terminology, with one that is dominated by an individualist perspective called the industrial episteme or ecology of knowing. So rather than speak of the Western world and the majority or developing third or non-Western world highlighting their geographic, demographic or economic divisions, I prefer to see the world as a schema of two major complex knowledge domains or epistemic ecologies, indigenous and industrial, with the intersecting influence and hybridization developing in the ecotone between the two. So the indigenous domain is more about a set of values and a way of seeing the world rather than a specific uh, geography. While they might be formed in a particular place, values are held and passed on by the indigenous that transcend their location of origin, or if they remain in the, in the land, the industrialized uh, urbanization in their own nations. Uh, dislocated and migrant people can find it difficult to retain their collectivist identity over time, but it's not impossible. Our convictions and values continue with us long after we've left the land that nurtured us or our forebears. So I include all collectivist orient oriented peoples, or at least their values, under the category of indigenous, because there are so many commonalities shared by people whose culture is still very much guided by the ideals, principles, priorities, and responsibilities of a collective. In contrast to the indigenous, those categorized as industrial uh, belong to, or have adapted to, Western industrial enlightenment philosophies that have so influenced politics, education, and commerce around the world that they can really no longer be geographically linked to the Euro-American, otherwise known as colonial, West. Successive generations of formerly collectivist peoples educated in Western-style universities and living in new urban centers have become hybridized to individualist industrial values to some degree. So industrial values arising out of Western enlightenment dualism continue to be the dominant influencer on the world stage. But the crises that COVID-19 have amplified, including the climate and globalization crises, especially now, are exposing the inadequacies of industrial values. The collectivist values of the indigenous are coming into focus as a way forward with potential to provide solutions to prob pro problems such as poverty, pollution, and political upheaval. So let me try and concretize the difference between indigenous and industrial for you. For the industrial episteme, relational expectations develop contractually. They're transactional and usually productivity or outcome oriented. Word pictures like team and partnership are used, which assume autonomous agents and collaboration with, within an atomized or disconnected world. Groups formed and dominated by this individualist perspective hold together because of a common aim or objective. They are dependent on outcome. The relationship is one of applying one's resources, which are owned by the individual contributor, toward the achievement of a task, and the reward is individually uh, meritous. In trying to mitigate the destruction industrialization has caused, a lot of the talk is around sustainability, effectively to enable continued consumption. Well, a concept growing in popularity in the climate change and creation care space, at least, is that of stewardship, which has actually an underlying drive to control. The indigenous knowledge ecology, and, and you'll understand here that these are types, this is typology, it's just very generic um, and broad, but an indigenous knowledge ecology is a counterpoint to this. It is an intimate, spiritually collective uh, connected collective uh, understanding of reality where the social agreement is covenantal, it's mutual, it's reciprocal and familial. 
the outcome is less important than the relationship building process undertaken along the way. Sharing is more important than acquisition. And very, very little is individually possessed and nothing is autonomous. Everything is interconnected and affected by human agency. Well, at best, the indigenous seek to honor and value and give toward the common good. When faced with a broken universe around us, we seek vitality to promote life in all things fostered by reciprocity. So a prevailing image in contrast or counterpoint to stewardship is that of guardianship, kaitiakitanga in Māori, where the dominant drive is mutual growth, not continued uh, consumption. So notice I used the word counterpoint and you need to hear that. I'm not suggesting that the industrial is completely bad or the indigenous is completely good. Both are needed. But to make space for an indigenous harmony to be heard, gaps needed to be created in the industrial melody. This space creation can be quite painful for industrials to accept. It's like a ripping apart. But as the saying goes, to the privileged, equality feels like discrimination or oppression. But we need to sit in the tensions of difference at the intersection of episteme, because it is here, I believe, in the ecotone between the two knowledge ecologies that new hybridities and even new species emerge. New knowledge comes forth, in other words. And since we're blending musical and ec ecological metaphors, as any stringed musician knows, you cannot create a harmonic without tuned attention. The common prescription for a diagnosis of difference these days seems to be to work towards some sort of resolution. If we can only get this done, we can move on. But I believe that is a fallacy. It's a fantasy. It's like ch chasing a mirage and it's exhausting. The very attempt to resolve tensions may destroy what is being created there uh, in the tension and you will certainly lose the harmony if you slacken it off. So please understand that my intention here is not to diminish the dignity of those who might identify as industrials in the schema, nor those who are committed to the industrials scientific methods, more to the point. I'm merely trying to amplify an alternative so we can work together for a better world to emerge out of the creative tension. So given that caveat, the struggle to decolonize from the industrial episteme can get quite messy as the indigenous fight for their voice to be heard and honored, especially in the environmental space and even in the theological environmental space of ecotheology. For example, Lily Mendoza and George Zachariah, editors of the 2022 anthology, came out this year, Decolonizing Ecotheology. Indigenous and Subaltern Challenges, the whole thing is the book's name, they pull no punches when they observe that, quote, environmental problems cannot be solved by reproducing structures of colonialism and capitalism. The very systems that produce these problems in the first place, colonial paternalism and tokenism, are evident in mainstream eco-theological ministries that initiate campaigns based on, say, simple living, vegetarianism, planting trees, and the reduce, reuse, recycle. In counterpoint, they argue, decolonizing ecotheology exposes the locations of privilege from whence these colonial and capitalist mainstream ecotheological ministries emanate. Indigenous and subaltern social movements that problematize climate change as CO2 I can't even pronounce it, CO2 colonialism, a play on colonialism, CO2 colonialism, are hence epistemological sources for eco-justice theologies. Now, there's a lot of big words in there to unpack, but basically what they're saying, if you're looking for a solution to the crisis today within the industrial episteme, my words, then you'll, you won't find a solution. And as I've said, I've 
I prefer to use industrial rather than colonial uh, nomenclature. But the argument here is that the solutions to the climate and other ecological crisis will be found within another framework or episteme. Can't uh, look in the framework with which they were created. So in, in philosopher Charles Taylor's terminology, we need a new social imaginary, uh, which he develops in his book, The Secular Age. This is essentially what Charles Eisenstein proposes in his book, Climate, A New Story, and a hat tip here to Dr. Hagar Cregan for putting me onto that book. Um, Eisenstein argues for a new mythology because the old one is not serving us well at all. So a new mythology is like a new imaginary. He says the old one, which I identify as the industrial episteme, is a story of separation. So he identifies the root cause of dysfunction similarly to me. He clarifies, quote, the story of separation is the separate self in a world of the other. Since I am separate from you, your well-being need not affect mine. He goes on to establish how this view of the world or mythology sets up, us up in competition with a zero-sum game. And I will show later on why I think that um, evolutionary theory is actually core to this. Everything outside of us then demands domination or else it threatens our well-being. So Eisenstein maintains that the story of separation reverberates through every institution in the industrial episteme. As one speaking from within that industrial epistemic ecology himself, Eisenstein borrows ideas elsewhere, or he has to borrow ideas elsewhere, to build his alternative narrative. He appropriates a Buddhist concept of interbeing, which emphasizes the relationships between all things. And to Eisenstein and his audience, this seems to be quite the novel idea. He acknowledges that it's not exactly new because, quote, older indigenous cultures hold some version of the story of interbeing, end quote but he still chooses to reinvent the wheel rather than actually investigate what people from an indigenous episteme have known for eons. He does occasionally give us a gracious nod, a gracious nod to the indigenous peoples. As an example, pertinent to this presentation, he observes, quote, more recently, remarkable scientific discoveries have emerged around plant intelligence uh, mycelial intelligence, soil intelligence, forest intelligence, and even the capacity of water to hold and transmit complex dynamic patterns of information. These discoveries seem to be converging on the universal indigenous belief that everything is alive and aware, end quote. Note carefully how he concedes the legitimacy of phenomena because it has been scientifically discovered by industrials for the first time. Even as he acknowledges indigenous reality, he diminishes centuries of indigenous knowledge by calling it a belief. Scientific knowledge, indigenous belief. There's a hierarchy for you. Treating it as if it was somehow substandard. This is a classic example of colonizing indigenous knowledge. Someone from the industrial episteme who treats indigenous wisdom far more seriously is uh, Monica uh, Gagliano in her 2018 book, Thus Spoke the Plant, another hat tip to Dr. Hogger Creek. So her research is located, located in the realm of scientific inquiry that Dr. Eisenstein mentioned, plant intelligence. But before she went deep into the world of the Amazon to investigate what she calls the vegetal kingdom, Dr. Gagliano had a transformative experience that shifted her perspective from objective to subjective, from the industrial, I would say, to the indigenous, well, close to it, um, but no cookie. But anyway, this account is so fascinating that I would like to quote it in some length. So before becoming a plant researcher, Dr. Gagliano was a marine biologist who researched tropical fish in the Great Barrier Reef. She would spend time observing them, uh, watching them, catching them up in a net, dissecting them, and then reporting her important findings about the changes to their well-being. Okay, so here's where something fundamentally changed in the way she quote unquote knew the world. 
I remember, she says, I remember that morning vividly. I'd been in the water every day for months, monitoring the reproductive output of damselfish pairs. Every day we encountered others at the edge. And as she was developing this, she goes on to say that they knew her personally and she came into this awareness that she knew them personally. She went into a, uh, the water with an intention to say goodbye to them. And um, no one was around, no one was approaching her, let alone approaching her open hand, but a chilling sensation filled her. In that moment, she says she knew that they knew that she felt all the blood of all the past killings that she had done in the name of science and a dreadful feeling of guilt flooded her heart. Frozen and not knowing what to do, she did what she always knew. She went back and scooped them up and killed them all. She now understands that theirs was an incredible sacrifice that delivered the one gift that would change everything for her, that is, because she said through the intimacy of our encounter, the time spent being together and being with each other had broken down the taxonomic boundary. In this permeability, the true nakedness had emerged, the kind of vulnerability necessary to establish openness. She says, they taught me empathy. They taught me kinship and communion and I never killed again, end quote. Wow, that is a discovery. Dr. Gagliano discovered personal intimacy in that created order. There's so much there, even the word permeability speaks loudly of the indigenous reality. Um, for us who live closely integrated with our habitats, with the whenua, as we Māori call it, which incidentally is also what we call the placenta, whenua, this intimate connection with our habitats is common to most Pacifica peoples. And here I'm going to quickly pivot to something of a, uh, an introduction of Matauranga Māori before I close. So Māori no knowledge is somewhat representative of the indigenous episteme. And in his collection of works, the re late Reverend Māori Marsden argued that science and technology produce the know-how, but they need to know the know why and it's the know why that indigenous people seek after the first principles or a priori assumptions that make up a basic maori metaphysic go something like this again from marsden ultimate reality is wider or, or spirit the universe is process the creator or first cause eo uh, he calls it eo takitaki the generous the genesis of the uh, cosmic process is the first cause. Spirit or ultimate reality is ubiquitous, imminent in the total process of the universe, upholding, sustaining, replenishing, regenerating all things by its ho or maori, the life principle or vital life force. As a corollary of all of this, therefore, all is one and interlocked together. I'm going to skip some here, but he's basically talking in terms of reconnecting with the life force of the world. Uh, we are effectively what Charles Taylor calls people of the enchantment. And with the Apostle Paul, we recognize that the vital life force flows like living waters from Christ who holds it all together. So Charles Taylor speaks of porosity and Dr. Galliano called it permeability, uh, perhaps the same meaning with, um, with different words. Curiously, even though she had um, a dramatic experience on the Great Barrier Reef, uh, Dr. Gagliano remained beholden to the industrial first principle of evolutionary biology. As wonderful as, as it is, her entire experience of indigenous knowledge was interpreted through her industrial epistemology. She effectively colonized indigenous knowledge by her imposition of this brutally competitive hierarchical theory of the development of the world, a theory which ultimately harms indigenous people and diminishes their knowledge. Interpreting her per precious Amazonian experience through this evolutionary lens could be considered a form of exploitation. So how then would an indigenous investigator understand the world in ways um, different from this? And as we've seen from Reverend Māori Marsden, many Māori believe in a creator, Io, 
a personifies or a personalized first cause who created all things according to their kind, similar enough to the narrative of Genesis in scripture, which itself is the narrative of an indigenous people, the Hebrew people. Māori are not so enamored by the how as much as the why, and the why should always be for mutual benefit. In Matauranga Māori, Māori ways of knowing, wherever we see that life morphs or develops, it's viewed through the lens of papa, rather than that of survival of the fittest. And in his uh, report for 1998, uh, the Te Oru Rangahau report, Reverend Marsden's nephew, to uh, Te Ahukaramu Charles Royal explains it this way, Papa is an analytical tool traditionally employed by Māori to understand the nature of phenomena, the origin of phenomena, the connections and relationships to phenomena, describing trends in phenomena, locating phenomena, extrapolating and predicting future phenomena. Papa is a way of organizing information into a coherent form, end quote. For Māori, then, transformation is not the result of competition. It is the evidence of the life force creating something distinct from the amalgamation of antecedent or pre-existing materials. As Royal says, Whakapapa is concerned with growth rather than deconstruction. More than sustainability, an, ind an indigenous concern is for promoting mutual vitality. In conclusion, time is running away. My point is this, our underlying often unexamined assumptions profoundly influence both our analysis and conclusions. The first step for people of the industrial episteme is to examine their assumptions because they deeply affect your conclusions. A separated reality will not allow us to navigate out of this crisis or the crises. We need to reconnect in a spiritually intimate way. The intimacy of connection assumed in indigenous knowledge can show us the way. I personally believe an indigenous experience of Christ is the safest way. And I haven't talked about that much, but we can explore that in the next half hour if you wish. But the knowledge, that knowledge is still emerging as we Maori followers of the Jesus way de decolonize our experience of the triune God. Ultimately, if industrials can recognize the gaps in their episteme and provide space for the assumptions of the indigenous to come forth in counterpoint, I contend that we will see beautiful things emerge in the ecotone between. The dominance of one over the other will not do. We need to work together in mutuality and hold the tension for therein lies the pathway to harmony in the ecotone. Therein lies new life. Well, thank you so much, Jay. That was a an amazing um, vision of mutuality and harmony and um, a way in which we can all go forward together. Many questions have already emerged, so I will get to those. Um, Ruth, do you want to give your question first? Now, I really enjoyed that. And um, this isn't... A I agree that Indigenous perspectives are providing a much-needed corrective to the industrial capitalist or epistle. I said, I mean an episteme. Um, what I find disturbing is that Western Christians have failed entirely to challenge individualism and a dualist power over nature. And it seems to me that Descartes and the Enlightenment were quite wrong and that Christians are supposed to care about the covenant and collective good. And have you found any useful Western critiques of the dominant Western industrial individualist epistine? There are bound to be tons out there that are starting to emerge. I think there's a zeitgeist that's allowing this to come forth. Um, one of the most, my, one of my favorites is um, Owen Barfield. He was one of the inklings uh, alongside C.S. Lewis. In fact, um, the law says um, that he was the theologian behind Lewis and Tolkien's um, development of their, their universes. Um, but Malcolm Geit, if you, if you look up Malcolm Geit, the poet, the Anglican poet in, in England, 
and ma marry that with Owen Barfield, you get some beautiful things coming forth. But Owen Barfield basically says that the modernist, what I would call industrial episteme, is thoroughly idolatrous because it separates the human being from the spiritual spirituality of the uh, created order and ultimately God, who is imminent in the created order. And that's a that's a very challenging thing for um, Western theology to get around. So as Nicola introduced me, she talked about me sort of um, countering the Euro-American uh, theological consensus. This is where the clash is. That's such a large consensus, such a significant consensus flowing out of reformed Protestant theology that um, there's a battle going on at the moment just to be heard. Um, I didn't focus on that. I focused much more on the 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 epistemes, but, um, but yes, they're out there and they can be found and um, he's hard to access, but Barfield is a brilliant, brilliant um, way to start. Right, I, I think Charles Taylor is actually Catholic, is he? He is, and he's, he's actually in favour of the, my reading, was very in favour of a re-enchantment, um, so yes. he, he's saying a similar thing. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. If I could interject here, Jay, because I would say that there's a lot more of this um, sort of very creative, harmonious meeting of, of um, worldviews than, than you're giving credit for. But I agree that the louder voices are the, you know, and just continue to be the industrial ones. Richard. Um, you you see my 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 part eyes a wee bit a wee bit cheeky and it perhaps uh, tries in, tries in with uh, a joint in with uh, Nicola's comment about not getting too caught up in a binary distinction perhaps between industrial and indigenous but um, uh, as as you say I say um, some centuries before Parker came here. Um, the traditional Māori way of being didn't work out so well for more who were hunted to extinction, which in turn meant there was no food source for the, the harst eagle, which died off as well. So in that sense, is there a danger of an idealised primitivism um, in our assessment of the integration between the Indigenous perspective and the creation? Absolutely, absolutely. Yeah, we can't idealize either. I mean, they weren't, we weren't, um, uh, well, it wasn't a paradise. Everybody knows the Māori tribes were at war with one another. It was Christianity that came in to bring harmony and peace to that, um, which revisionist um, historians amongst Māori and others in the decolonizing process uh, are quick to dismiss. But you're quite right. I mean, it's not all perfect. And one of the things, again, leaning a little bit more on um, Owen Barfield is he talks about the development, or he actually uses the word evolution in its developmental sense, not its, in its um, a biological sense, but the evolution of, of consciousness. And I think that's what's happening amongst Indigenous people. In this exposure, we're learning. So this is why I say that the industrial perspective is helpful for coming in because it shows the the destruction it really amplifies the mm. destruction and many maori now realize with regret that their our forebears um, didn't do well with um caretaking for that which was given to us so yeah i'll concede that with um yeah. with ease cannot quit Okay, um, no, so we have two questions now, one from me and one from Charles are about evolution. I mean, I would say that evolutionary theory um, no longer is just um, survival of the fittest and that mutuality and cooperation are major, are seen to be major drivers of evolutionary change. So a lot of um, sort of harmony there, I would, I would say, and that perhaps we need to think very carefully when we use the word evolution, you know what it really means. But um, Charles, do you want to also give your um, thoughts about that. Yes, thanks, Nicola. Um, I was intrigued by you linked evolution with the industrial um, episteme uh, that drove the idea of 
evolving upwards and some species, particularly humans, getting better and therefore dominating or being the fittest to survive and therefore others sort of dying out. So either does the theory of evolution, do you think it should be dropped or can it be modified, I gather, the way that Nicola is proposing? Well, I would argue dropped because it still carries some a priori um, assumptions that, uh, I mean, if you, if you want to develop something else, call it something else, but if it has roots in biological evolution or Darwinism, then as um, the doctor that went into the Amazon had, I mean, she just kept referring to the plants ha having evolved over time. So there was that she went in and she didn't lose that assumption of that evolutionary process. And so for, from a theological perspective, just take animism. Animism was developed out of a concept out of evolutionary biology adopted by anthropologists co-opted by missionaries and missionary anthropologists and had it's been weaponized against indigenous theologizing so everything now is animist if you're talking about life force whereas it's only the industrialized um enlightened so-called enlightened people that have dismissed a life force in reality pretty much every other culture every other religion acknowledges that vital life force um and it, it was there in the roots of, um, of the Europeans as well. So this idea of animism, and don't get me wrong, I think the bio, it, um, witchcraft and idolatry is biblically reprehensible. So I'm, I'm separating that out from this concept of animism. So by um, talking about animism as an evolutionary thing, so the animist people were the most primitive and then the industrialized people are the most enlightened. That hierarchy there is a classic case. Um, I think we need to toss it out. And there may be some mutuality in the ecotone of this. And I would argue a lot of the um, feminist worldview um, methodologies, a lot of the, um, shall we say, soft scientists, sciences are drawing actually from a more indigenous episteme co-opting it exploiting it but aside from that if we sit and we acknowledge that there's this echo tone that's happening as the um, indigenous increase their voice and the industrials accept that voice we are seeing some of this evolution of the evolutionary theory happen and because it, it doesn't come from nowhere so postmodernism is arising out of post-colonialism, which arises out of the intersect between industrials and indigenous. So it all comes back to that, um, those epistemes. And we are now living in an increasing ecotone um, between the, the tension between the two. Um, but yeah, something will have to give way for this new thing to morph up. But if we keep calling it evolution, I think we'll keep tripping over ourselves personally. We'll have to Thank have you. more conversations, Jay, about evolution offline, probably. But, um, I think so. <laughs> Chris. I thought it was. <laughs> Chris, Chris. Um, you were going to be mute, but you're going to, have to say a lot, in fact. So why don't no, you look, I, I won't say a lot. I'll let people read it in the chat. But the short, the short question is, um, is there a danger of syncretism here? That's the other. $64 million word that I wish. Or is that just an industrial out. Western question? It is. It's thoroughly an industrial <laughs> Western question. Syncretism is just your perspective of my belief system. So, um, <laughs> which is why I chose um, to do my doctorate at Fuller under Dan Shaw, because we had this conversation at Laidlaw College uh, before I signed up to Fuller. And I said, one of the things that's really irking me is every time you bring up indigenous spiritualities and in, in Christian theology, especially evangelical theology, you get slammed with this thing called syncretism. And he shot back that saying, well, syncretism is just your judgment on my belief. And, uh, and it is. So, but there is biblically authentic, and then there is biblically non-authentic. So let's start with biblically authentic. The trees clap their hands, the rocks cry out. The oceans roar. They're, they're, that's not just personification in scripture when we talk about when we hear creation 
singing, talking, moving, and science is now proving that res creation res literally resonates. So even rocks. So that's what my argument would be. We need to go back to scripture with an indigenous perspective. I, I personally um, would call it a relational hermeneutic and see it from a fresh perspective. Get rid of animism, get rid of syncretism. Let's start to look at biblical authenticity and, uh, and take it from there afresh. Because the Bible, I believe, shalom. Shalom is the ultimate aim of the of revelation of the whole biblical narrative. It's what we're all heading for. And shalom is harmony and tension. Unity is harmony held in tension. And Christ is the one that holds it. We're in a perpet in the state of perpetual reconciliation. And um, if we can start to see scripture from that and allow and concede a lot more from an indigenous perspective, I think we'll have a theological revolution. Let alone in Reformation. So you really pushed my button there, and I didn't even read the. I'll read the comment now, Chris. But yes, right. create the created order has agency. It communicates to us, I and mean, we can relate to it. You know, I mean, one does get that coming through in process theology, for example. Um, so it's not completely unknown understanding in the West either. I draw um, a lot from the Eastern um, yeah. Eastern Orthodoxy has it as well. So yes, yeah. you're quite right. Daniel, do you want to give your question? Daniel? Yeah, yeah, Kira J. Mm -hmm. um, Daniel, Kira. So my question comes from the context. I'm, I'm a secondary school teacher myself, and the question I had is, I'm just wondering if you had any thoughts on how young Indigenous people can feel confident in operating successfully through the school system. Uh, in the two worlds that you describe, indigenous and industrial, so having success in those STEM subjects. In the STEM subjects? Yeah, like science, technology, yeah. engineering, mathematics, just having, yeah, you know, working those two realms that you describe. Yeah. Unfortunately, this is one of the areas where there is a bit of um, oh, unfair advantage for those who grew up, grow up in an industrialized context i mean i grew up in that context i grew up white my surname was white from my stepfather um i was treated as a white person through uh, my educational system i was uh, accommodated as a white person in my christian experience through my early um theological training and i felt the entire i felt dissonance the entire time i could not be myself. It wasn't until I started my doctorate that I realized I needed to take ownership um, of my heritage. And in fact, there found both resonance and confidence in myself because, and here's probably the trick, is, is I found my papa. I rooted myself in my both my father and my father's father's line, um, my, the people that I belong to, that belonging that I didn't discover until I was in my 40s, I didn't meet my father until I was 42, was uh, almost another born again experience for me. It, it really opened up a huge sense of what I would call destiny. And so there is a, a sense that I am now serving as my forefathers served in religious spiritual ministry. My, ma my father was a Mormon bishop and his grandfather was a tohonga, and so we're going back. And so I can see myself in a genetic line that gave me huge confidence that I didn't have before. And I stand in that now, and I represent them before you right now with, um, with much more awareness that I couldn't articulate before. So a Māori who are in the in, um, kapahaka groups who are rooted in their whakapapa and their, their uh, iwi, their hapu, who are encouraged at home to be Māori, that uh, is probably the first start, is to reconnect these people with, and then from there, that they engage in engineering or maths, they'll engage it from a Māori perspective, where maths one-on-one -on -one make two. No, 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 one-on-one -on -one make, not two of the same kind, it's, it's whakapapa, one-on-one -on -one make kind of a, a new thing. Anyway, so it just shifts some of the view of the world. Oh, kia ora, kia ora, Jay. 
Okay, we have quite a few questions to get through. So I'm just going to read this one um, from Jean Palmer. Celtic Christianity is an older Western tradition that has a familial view um, of human and non-human creation. Think of the writings of St. Patrick and the stories of Celtic saints. You want to respond to that, Jay? St. Patrick was indigenous. The Celts were indigenous. Um, when I set up the industrial and indigenous, I'm skipping over the um, ancient Western and Eastern orthodoxies and starting at the Reformation. So if that encourages you as a Christian, Celtic theology is a source for us wrestling with what does our Māori theology mean in a biblically authentic way. We look to the Celts, we look to St. Patrick, because we see that integrated understanding of reality there. We see what what um, the industrials would see as syncretism in, in ancient Celtic uh, Christianity, which Eastern Orthodoxy still maintain this infusion of, of godhood in creation, that God extends the God self into creation in some form. I um, personally, I stop short of saying the Holy Spirit is everywhere. I don't equate life force with the Holy Spirit, whereas a lot of indigenous uh, Christians would talk about the Spirit of God synonymous with life force and Holy Spirit. I would, as an evangelical theologian, I would argue the Holy Spirit is only accessible to those now uh, through Christ, through allegiance to Christ, but the life force of God continues in a, um, in a, oh, lost the, the common grace type of, of aspect. And that's what is um, an access point to the creator God through, from all peoples. It's not salvific. Um, Lisa, story, do you want to? Can you uh, that, was, that was me actually. Oh, Bridget. <laughs> Bridget. No. No, no, Jay. Hi. Hello. Uh, Jay, as, as you know, we're uh, living at the moment in, in Asia, surrounded by obviously Asian people. And um, so I was interested to pick up wisdom from you in your uh, seminar about, you know, how that might help us in our context. Um, but I'm, I'm not clear how the, the people of Asia, which, you know, is a large part of the world's population, fit, fit in. They do. They fit in a lot better than the people of Latin America. Latin Americans are typically Pākehā, those <laughs> that we engage with, and there are Latin American indigenous. But in Asia, there's a very deep indigenous epistemology around that. I mean, you just think of one of the ways of thinking of indigenous epistemology is that it's an honor-based epistemology. So when you're talking about honor, you're talking about face, you're talking about ancestry, you're talking all of that is reverberant with an indigenous epistemology. And uh, I'm sitting with some um, Asian theologians in the missions sphere who are trying to argue for a much higher regard for the honoring of ancestors um, within Asian expressions of Christianity, because it's just a fundamentally dishonoring um, faith system if you dismiss your ancestors. And we understand that as Māori. Our whakapapa, our ancestors are with us, viscerally present in all we do. Um, now, now that I can articulate it, I'm very conscious that my forebears are uh, kind of behind me, or if you will, as the cloud of witnesses that could be interpreted in, from Hebrews in different ways. But it's quite legitimate, I think, to um, to view that. Now, are they saved? Are they unsaved because they didn't hear about Jesus? Well, that's where you have to just lean on the grace of God and the, and the judgment of God. It's not for us to say really either way. I certainly wouldn't come down hard and fast on it. But so much of the indigenous perspective comes from South Asia, East Asia. I mean, we Māori come from East Asia, um, tracking our genetic heritage back to Taiwan, that disputed nation in the ocean there. So I encourage you to, to yeah, embrace it as an indigenous worldview there up in the mountains, because um, yeah, it could open a lot. And in, in fact, um, one of my friends is exploring up there in Northeast India, uh, a much more indigenous um, theologies. And there's some exciting work going on there. Alison Howell says you probably know the Ghanaian theologian Kwame Bediako, right? Um, who resonates with a lot of what you have said. 
Do you want to talk about <laughs> Vidyako? Um, yeah, he, he's the pioneer, like Lemon Senna, that these uh, great pioneers of a different way of thinking. He broke the ice. Um, a lot of them were informed a bit like um, liberation theolo theologians were informed by the Eurocentric, Euro-American, particularly the Eurocentric philosophy and theological consensus. Even though they were deconstructionists, we're seeing a new wave of African, Indian, Asian, and um, indigenous Latino theologians coming forth who don't have, they haven't been trained in the West. They've, they're a bit more distant from that. So Bidioko has brought a lot of African theology to the fore, a lot of the, the episteme to the fore, and we're all feeding off that. I think a little bit like hyenas feeding off a carcass. But um, in, in doing so, it, again, it's hybridizing and it's moving further and further away from a dependency of of using the European philosophies and the European methodologies um, as our sounding board and finding new confidence and being able to articulate things in our own right. And I think that those of the age of Biriaco were a little bit beholden still. Their debate was still with the West. Now I'm talking with um, indigenous theologians who just are completely not completely ignoring the West, but they'd love to. They still have to dialogue with Western theology, <laughs> but it's um, it's moving, growing uh, beyond that, and and it's incredibly exciting to see. Well, but, thank you, uh, Jay. Um, you've given us a lot to think about and a lot to talk about, and and you've opened up a whole new can of worms. And so, um, thank you so much for being here tonight. Um, we're very grateful to you for for giving this very sort of fresh new way of, 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 um, of, of approaching the whole problem of climate change and nature. And we're going to finish, I think Sarah, you're going to pray for us as we go out, but then feel free to leave or feel free to stay after that. And if Jay, you don't mind just doing a bit more discussion afterwards. Thank you. Everybody. Let's pray. Creator God, we thank you for our Indigenous peoples in both New Zealand and Australia who have cared for your creation for thousands of years and for the connectedness they feel to the natural world and the passion they have to protect and nurture it. We thank you for their wisdom and knowledge and we pray that our hearts will transform so that we will cherish all life and work together to heal some of the damage that we have done. Lord, show us how to do things well today so that others may not suffer tomorrow. Show us how to make our contribution as we change the way we live, travel, make and consume, distribute and sell, use and reuse. Show us how to do simple things well in our home, places of work and our daily lives. Show us how to protect the world you made in all its diversity and goodness. Create a God whose love was poured out in Jesus. Give us strength and the vision to so care for your world and its peoples that we may be faithful stewards of your creation, working in the power of your Holy Spirit. Amen. <laughs>